very excited for this session um, and to introduce two really amazing women that I've enjoyed working with on this webinar um, and the book that they just released, Remote Works, um, Allie Green and Tam Sanderson. They will be leading this session. It'll be interactive. So make sure you've got some coffee, some water, you're ready to dive in and have a really good start to your day. Uh, but ladies, I would love to hand it off to you and uh, you can kick us off. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, we are super excited to be here with the Hone Group. Uh, we love to keep things interactive, so keep that chat box open. Feel free to um, chat in there if anything resonates or you want to ask questions. Um, we try to, yeah, make sure that you know we have multiple forms of ways to communicate on this. But today we are going to talk about one of our very favorite uh topics around remote work and it's remote remote productivity and we are hoping that we will give a different spin on it uh than what you've heard before and so just a little bit about us my name is tam i am coming in from cambridge massachusetts and i am the co-author of remote works with ali green i guess hey, as everybody yeah, uh, as a little bit of my background, I spent 15, 17 years in tech. Um, the most notable all remote company was Automatic, but I also worked in more traditional companies like Google. Um, and we love remote work and we're really inspired to encourage more people to do it. Ali, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm super excited to be here. Um, remote work has always been part of my journey, even when I was working in an office. I started my career at a startup in Washington, D.C. and worked with people that were in sales on the ground all over uh, North America. And then I really hit my stride when it came to remote work and remote leadership as the former director of people at DuckDuckGo. And I also have experience with a more recent startup as their former head of culture and community Oyster, which is an amazing program that helps hire people globally. And as a digital nomad, it's one of the pieces of remote work that is close to my heart as well. And I can't wait to share some tips and tricks about productivity that I've gleaned from traveling all over the world and seeing how different people approach their work days. Awesome, thanks, Allie. Okay, so we have an agenda for today, uh, which I guess is always a good productivity and remote practice. Uh, we're gonna start by talking about managing your energy, your time, and your focus. Then we're going to talk about organizing your digital house and also telling you what a digital house is and why it's important for remote work. And then at the end, we'll leave some time for Q&A and getting in touch because um, we'd love to hear if you have additional questions. And so we always, I guess, uh, Ali and I are nerds and we love to define words. And so we used to be remote work nomads and we would lead these salons and we would ask people to define things like what is bravery what is courage um what are these terms that often um there's a lot of jargon but we don't actually know what they mean and so a lot of times you'll see productivity right now in the news there's layoffs companies aren't as productive as they should be um, we're measuring productivity but what does that actually mean um and so we went straight to the the source we went to the dictionary and it is the ability to generate create, enhance, or bring forth. And what I really like about that definition is the fact that it is very action oriented. It is not about doing your to-do list because you could have a to-do list that actually is not going to generate, create, or enhance anything. It's not about getting things done super fast or doing as many things as possible in a certain amount of time. Instead, it's about what are you delivering? What is the output that you are creating and bringing forth in the world? And is that important and is that your goal? Ali, anything you'd like to chime in with uh, the definition of productivity? I would love to just share that when we talk about productivity, people oftentimes confuse it with getting as much done as possible and often forget that it's really important to get the right things done. And so I'm happy that we're going to be talking a lot about that today. And another myth to bust, it's not just about time management. So you noticed on the agenda that managing your time is only one third of the things that we have in our control to increase productivity. And so those are things that people always come to us and say, oh, we have to get all this stuff done or we have to manage our time better. And, and I think that's totally the, the wrong way to think about productivity. And hopefully by the end of today's short session, you'll have some clues about the right ways to think about it. Awesome. Thanks, Allie. And so with that, I am going to hand it over to Allie to talk about um, kind of our framework 
for managing your energy, time, and focus to get more things done at work. And so with that, Allie, do you want to talk to us about managing your energy? Yeah. Thanks so much, Tam. So as I mentioned, um, it's not just about managing your time. We're going to get there in a little bit, but before you can even think about how to approach time, the sacred 24 hours in a day, it really comes down to understanding that not all time is created equal. And when I think about managing your energy, I go back to one very specific aha moment that I've had where in my former role as head of people, I I was responsible for triaging and improving our hiring process. And it was not one of the things in all of the, the activities of the HR world that I necessarily enjoyed. And so I said to myself, Allie, you need to get really serious about this. Right when you wake up, it's going to be the first thing you do. You're going to sit down at your computer in your home office, and you're going to go through all of the develop the developer resumes coming in and see how we can improve the hiring process. And it would just take me hours and hours to get this task done because frankly, it wasn't my favorite thing to do. And then I realized, why am I trying to force myself to be productive by sitting at a desk alone in my home and working early in the morning when none of those things make me happy, make me feel joy and bring me energy. And I realized by changing a few things, instead, I I started to work in the evenings on my sofa while drinking tea and listening to music and reading the resumes. Um, I was able to get the work done a lot faster. And I only had to read the resumes once to actually absorb the information that was in them. Whereas when I forced myself to do the work, I was rereading the same information because I was not getting it. And all this goes to show in this first bullet point here is that you're more effective and you're more efficient when you're working at your peak performance hours. And so stop trying to fit yourself into someone else's mold. And when it comes to managing your energy, the the first thing people think of is, oh, I'm a morning bird and the morning bird catches the worm or I'm a night owl. And there, there's a lot of truth to this. And so we all have different biological chronotypes. If we're a morning person, an afternoon person, Um, It really does impact how you think and how you work, but there's other ways of managing your energy as well. Do you get energy being around people or do you need to be focused in your cave? Do you like to um, work with music on or do you like to work in silence? Is there certain types of activities such as speaking publicly that, that bring you energy or writing and analyzing data that bring you energy? And the more you can learn about that, the more you can learn how to structure your day towards a goal of productivity. And so we're going to share a few actionable tools that you can use to start learning how to manage your energy. So the first one is chronotypes, which I just alluded to. And so this is the actual biological science behind if you're a morning person or a night owl. Night Owl. So we partnered um, in our book with an amazing organization uh, led by a Dr. Sahar called Becoming Superhuman and actually found that there are three main ways that people use their energy throughout the day. And so it's true that some people are, in fact, uh, morning people. Um, In fact, 20 to 25 percent of the population fits into this. And these are people that really can feel alive in the morning. They can be the people that wake up and get right into the work at hand and have that focused time with their cup of coffee in the morning. Um, On the the other extreme of that, there's the night owl. This is Tam. where, Tam, if you want to chime into what it felt like to be forced to work in, in a regular nine to five uh, a day, we can really learn a lot. Um, yeah, I um, I am very much a night owl and it is proven from growing up. So I was the kid that always fell asleep latest at sleepover. So everybody else would be going to sleep and I'd still be very much wired. When I was in college, I chose to work out at like 11 p.m. every night and then I would go study at IHOP afterwards. I am very much wired that way. But then I went into the workforce. My first job was in management consulting. And all of a sudden, I was taking the 6 a.m. red eye flight out on Monday mornings, which meant I was getting up at 3.30 a.m. Ironically, uh, I had to go on the flight through Vegas. So I'd be the only person on that plane in a business suit. Everybody else was ready to have fun and party. Um, But I was perpetually tired. 
I had all these like energy drops. I kept trying to be a morning person. It just didn't work. And it was when I moved to an all remote company that I started being able to switch my schedule truly around my chronotypes. And I just felt so much better, just energetic, but also just like more awake and more productive and that I was really able to seize life in a different way. And now I notice that in our workflow, because Tam really hits her stride in the evening. And because we're dialing in from two different time zones, I have the benefit of sleep while Tam's busy getting work done for, for us and our book and our company. And I wake up having new activities to do. And so learning about how best you work and then integrating it with a team can be really special if you have the benefit of people on two different types of chronotypes working together so that you're continuously building off each other's ideas in an asynchronous world. And so for me, I'm more of the middle person. Um, I don't have one peak throughout the day. I like to really work in a nonlinear fashion. So I might work for an hour in the morning getting my admin tasks in order, especially as I see the work come in from Tam. But I really hit my focus stride in the afternoon. And I used to always joke that I was solidly an afternoon person. Like I can't wake up early, but I also can't stay up late. And people wouldn't take me seriously until we learned about the chronotypes. And now I know that I get my best work done in a very counterintuitive 2 p.m. to sort of 6 p.m. slot where most people joke about having sort of that that after lunch slump. But for me, it's completely the opposite. And so I've learned to lean into that by taking that afternoon time to really be creative and and produce work. And so once you know more about yourself and you start cultivating self-awareness, not just around again, when you work best, but also how and where you can really lean into managing your energy. So the second tool I want to share with you all, and this is one of my absolute favorite tools from our entire book is energy tracking. And we'll share a link in the chat, but just to give you a quick sneak peek of what energy tracking is, it's a diary study that you can do on yourself. And the way that it works is that you take one week where you really sit down and analyze all the activities that you're doing throughout the day. And if before you have energy and if after you have even more energy or if you've lost energy. And from that, this tool will help you reflect on what situation you is the best for you to optimize your productivity. So if you don't know things like really, do you work best when you're around other people? Do you work best when you're doing analytical tasks? Do you work best when you're on calls or if you're working asynchronously? So the more you can learn these things about yourself, which we've never really had a chance to do before in the history of work, we were just told to be productive from nine to five in an office. Now you have all this room to experiment. And this is a tool to help streamline the experimentation into actionable results that will help you change how you live your day and how you approach work. And so it's really quite amazing. Um, I encourage all of you to try it out and then come back and tell us what things you've noticed about yourself. And we're going to do a quick little Q&A between me and Tam about how we've used these two tools to change our work style since moving to a remote work setup. Awesome. Great, Allie. Um, Okay, so... Which, who wants to go first? I can talk a little bit more to the chronotypes of like how I ended up changing that schedule. So yeah, go for it. um, When I moved to Automatic, which is WordPress and Tumblr and WooCommerce, I immediately uh, left the US, became a digital nomad, and I moved to uh, Portugal as my first stop. Um, But the way I ended up shifting around this is I would have a slower morning. And so I would wake up, have a nice coffee, eat some breakfast. I would then do some really kind of heads down work from usually about 11 to one, 11 to two. I would have a little lunch. I would go for a walk along the kind of water, the beach. Maybe I'd go to a museum. And then I would take a lot of my calls from five to probably 8 p.m. I didn't have to take that many, but I was an external um, facing a uh, member of the automatic team. So I would do corp dev and partnerships calls often with Silicon Valley, but all of a sudden I was working in these kind of hours that were different. Usually people would not want to stay, you know, after 5 PM in a traditional nine to five workforce. But I found that I actually really loved working in those PM hours and it really fit me um, so that I could do a lot of things in the daytime and get, you know, kind of the sun and get, you know, some energy and walk around and, you know, have almost kind of like a weekend day in the middle of the week. 
And Ali, what about you? Tell me more about kind of energy tracking and how you've changed your schedule around doing your own little diary study. Yeah, I love that. So when it comes to energy tracking, I notice what boosts my energy is having small, consistent chunks of work throughout the day and working in coffee shops. And so I use a hack I call one place, one goal to boost my energy throughout the day where I pick one dedicated task. I do that in one location, um, such as a cafe. And when I finish that task, I leave, I go for a walk, maybe back home and at my kitchen table, I'll take a few calls. And that way I'm mentally compartmentalizing the work and breaking it up and giving myself quick hits of getting out in nature and moving my body. All are things that boost my energy. On the flip side, I learned very quickly what drains my energy is silence. And um, it's very counterintuitive. A lot of people need silence to focus and I need background noise. And so it's awesome as a digital nomad to be able to be in coffee shops and hear the white noise of foreign languages being spoken or even just turning on music or a movie at home and being able to be cozy and and get work done, um, knowing that none of my coworkers are gonna judge me for, for having silly music on while I'm, you know, analyzing Excel sheets. And so it's been really great to learn that silent situations, the cubicle was really for me so challenging to focus on work because there was this idea that I had to have my headphones in and be quiet. And those were things that really brought me down. Thanks Allie for sharing. And we also have somebody that loves working in coffee shops from the audience. Um, what, what something I actually noticed with when I was doing energy tracking is, I actually get a lot for tasks I don't necessarily love doing. So imagine answering emails or doing more administrative tasks. Um, I have a hard time doing those in little pieces, but I actually, I get very motivated by doing them back to back. So I'll do kind of an hour and just like really go through all my emails or all my administrative tasks or Asana. And I start building a lot of energy through completing it. So I actually found that interesting to know about myself that if I group or chunk different tasks together, I can create momentum, which can be, um, you know, very different than if I'm just answering them one off. Uh, And I guess that resonates with some people. People are mentioning the progress principle, um, but that's something I learned about myself. And now I use that hack when there's things that I don't necessarily want to do. I even sometimes use that with my kind of personal chores as well, where I'll be like, I have 15 minutes. Let's see how quickly I can clean this kitchen. And I actually get really excited about that versus um, sometimes seeing a lot of dishes in my sink. Okay. So next we are going to go on to managing your time. So this is the next pillar of how to get things done. And so this is probably the most obvious one that, you know, we talk about a lot within productivity hacks and productivity literature. Um, Our brains though are wired to seek instant gratification and quick sources of dopamine. And so what you may notice is that when you are trying to manage your time, you may be drawn to certain things Uh, that you get a quick reward for. So that could be you answer an email and you get a reward because somebody responds back really quick, or you put something on LinkedIn and you get a reward because somebody likes it. Um, You know, we are wired that way. And so when we were talking to uh, Dr. Sahar, she was kind of mentioning, you know, rather than fight against it, which we often do, we, you know, we shame ourselves for being, um, uh, procrastinating, we shame ourselves for getting distracted or, you know, popping onto social media. Um, but she actually said, rather than fight against that instant kind of gratification, she said that we can actually embrace it and work with it by developing systems to get your most important tasks done and then feeling really good after completing those and getting that dopamine rush from uh, fulfilling those tasks. And so we end up kind of using this concept called um, the most important task. So an MIT. Uh, I'm sure that people use different versions of this. Uh, I think there's a concept called like eat the frog, which sounds a little vile, but uh, it's a similar concept. But essentially what this recommends is like, and I'm going to go through an example of not Allie Green, but another person we interviewed for our book, Allie Brandt. And she had a really interesting system for managing MITs. So every day she goes through her sauna and as she's starting her day out, she spends about 10 to 15 minutes before getting into anything. So before she does a call, gets into work, um, starts doing project management, et cetera. And she will divide things into three different buckets. So the first bucket is MIT. And so this is the most important task of the day. What's the one to two things that she has to get done to feel really good about getting her stuff done and accomplishing things for the day? 
Uh, I'll give an example. Yesterday, I had kind of two uh, MITs that I felt like I really needed to get done. I wanted to write this one article on how to write a book. And so I got that done. And then I also had an email of um, for a partnership that I wanted to send out because it's something that we are really excited about. So once I got those two things done, I felt really good about the rest of my day. And I was able to draw and paint and do other kind of tasks. But I felt like, yes, I hit my two MITs and I got a dopamine rush from that. The second bucket uh, is usually your non-MITs, but it would be nice to get done. And so I often have kind of a running list of those. Um, taxes have been on that list for a while. And for whatever reason, they keep you know switching to the next day. Um, but those might also be kind of things that are smaller. You don't necessarily have to get it done today, but it would be nice to get kind of a, um, a head start on. But I think the third bucket uh, is the most interesting. And so um, when Allie Brandt does her kind of you, uh, does her days, she noticed that, you know, she might have an MIT, she might have, uh, you know, like secondary tasks for the day, but what happens when you have such, like, you have all these people coming at you throughout the day, you have these fire drills and these Slack messages, and there's all these things that pop up and you're like, oh my gosh, I had a great plan at 8 a.m. and now I can't get any of it done because all these things have come in. And so um, Allie Brandt would do this thing called triaging. And she would take all these tasks that would come in, asks on Slack, you know, emails that would come in, pings, et cetera. And she would like actually not respond to them and just pile them away in this kind of third bucket. And then when she had time, she would prioritize those into her other two buckets. And I thought that was a really nice practice because it allowed her to really focus on those MITs because it's the problem is not setting those. I think the problem of getting those done is often because other things come in and distract us. Um, yeah, and somebody else just mentioned that they needed to hear this because they um, they always have fire drills. And yes, uh, that is a constant commotion that a lot of people hear. Um, so with this, Ali, do you want to go through some um, of our, you know, what we've learned in action? Yeah, so um, when it comes to working according to your top priorities, I find the number one thing is to um, publicly, whatever that means for you and your team, hold yourself accountable. And the way that Tam and I do this is by having an asynchronous standup. So every Monday we auto populate a template where we commit to what our top priority is for the week. We also have a section that is sort of our running to-do list where we say, yes, these are other things going on, but I'm purposefully and intentionally not prioritizing them. And so it really helps us get insight and um, a lot of visibility into what is the most important for each other and allows us a space to question those assumptions. And so if there's something that I really need help with, and I think that it is a task for two people and it's a priority for the business, it gives us that room to have those conversations and to decide together as a team. And I think by announcing what your top priority is at the beginning of the week, holding yourself accountable to a teammate. And then at the end of the week, checking in on your progress is a really great system to work according to your top priorities. Um, Tam, is there anything else you do in, in your personal routine that helps you stay accountable to your top priorities? Yeah, so I guess there's um, maybe two things that I like to do. So um, one, I noticed that I had a lot of switching costs when I would go between meetings and heads down time. So if I had a meeting for 30 minutes and then all of a sudden I had like kind of a weird 30 minutes or an hour before the next one. And so when it is in my control, which is not always, but I really try to group all of my meetings together back to back so that I can then have heads down time that's uninterrupted. Because what I noticed is if I did those calls in a group, I would get energy from talking to people. I would get more stamina throughout the day. And then I wasn't getting distracted because I really can't, when I'm switching from a meeting to heads down time, it takes like 10 minutes to kind of chill out from the call, maybe 10 minutes to start getting into a project. Then all of a sudden I'm like setting an alarm to remember to get on to the next one. Um, another thing I like to do is, you know, if you do have those awkward like 15 or 20 minutes between different tasks, I like to have kind of a running list of MITs that don't take that long. And so breaking up larger tasks into small things. Uh, I also like to uh, intermix personal items and work items. So if I have a weird five to 10 minutes, I might go take my trash out. And then I feel very accomplished for doing that one task. And it's actually um, then kind of feels like I'm using that kind of awkward space throughout the day. So those are a couple of the things that I like to do with managing my time. 
I love that. And when it comes to the not top priority things, um, some tricks that you mentioned, I think are good for, for both making sure the top priority gets done and the, the other things. And one thing that I've been doing recently when it comes to the non MITs is determining which ones of those going back to the first section and bringing all of these themes together. What are the non MITs that boost my energy and how can I do those tasks first before starting something that might be a most important task, but something that's more challenging for me from a happiness perspective or an energy perspective. So I, I do a short little task that I'm really into, and then it leads me into a longer task that is a higher priority for the company or for the project that I'm working on. So I don't always start my day with the most important thing. I start with the thing that is going to balance out and give me that longevity. Yeah, Ali, I think that's a great point about not necessarily starting out with your most important task. Um, so Nicole shared in the chat, we mentioned chronotypes, but there's actually slot times that science recommends to do your most important task throughout the day. And based on your chronotype, that's not always in the morning. So for example, as a night owl, my best hours to do like a really intense, creative need to be in flow type of task is five to 7 PM. And then actually like, I think 11 to one in the morning. And so that is when I realized that, and I kind of found out my chronotype, I started shifting a lot of my uh, more important work to later in the day. Okay. We are going to do a poll to start off the next one. Um, just one second. Sorry, I'm moving. I can't see because of the chat. Um, yes, let's take it to the polls. Okay, so for this, we are going to do, we are going to talk now a little bit about our third concept. So this is managing your focus. And so with managing your focus, we wanted to first kind of think about who we are. We are humans. We are not robots. We have certain things that are just wired into us based on nature. And so often we're kind of working around what our natural ways to work are. So um, here are two questions to kind of set the stage. Uh, on the left side, you know, how long can you sustain focus? Um, and so put your answers in there. We have a couple of choices. And then also, once you've done that, take a look on the right side. How often does your time, does your mind wander? And so um, we'll give you a few seconds. I already see some of the answers coming in, which are interesting. And we'll share, we'll sh uh, tell you what science says. And then with that, we will rethink how to focus your time. Okay, so we'll give another maybe five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so can people see the results out there? Okay, so number one, how long can you sustain your focus? It seems like the majority answer was 20 to 25 minutes, but that is optimistic. Uh, what um, research has shown is that it's actually only seven to 10 minutes that you can focus at a time. And then you need to take some type of break and then you can start another seven to 10 minute period. And so when I found out this information, it made a lot of sense and it actually made me feel a lot better about myself because I do remember being like, oh, wow, I have a really hard time fully concentrating for 30 minutes at a time or an hour. And that is often how kind of meetings are set up on calendars. Uh, when you look at the um, different kind of productivity principles, there's a lot about working for 25 minutes, taking a five minute break and then starting again. But seven to 10 minutes is really the amount of time you can spend. And so uh, when you are working in chunks and you want to focus, it's important to try to think about like, what are 10 minutes of things that I can do? Then I can, you know, stretch, I can look around and then I can start again. Um, and then the second uh, question is, how often does your mind wander? And so actually the majority of people got this right. It is 30%. Um, so if your mind has wandered some during this webinar, don't, don't feel bad. We don't feel bad. It is just by nature. It is okay for your mind to wander. There's reasons for that. And there's probably a lot of things going on in the back of your mind because of that. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that is at work in your unconscious uh, that we don't even have necessarily access to. So with that, Ali, do you want to talk a little bit about these um, macro breaks? Yeah, um, I want to first address a comment that I saw in the chat 
um, that was really interesting around a feeling of guilt that, and, and does it ever go away when you're blending personal chores and work, um, during normal work hours. And I would say that I, I can't speak for you, but I do think that for myself, the, the guilt, the uncomfortableness, the, is this okay? Naturally comes with experience of remote work, because you're starting to question, what does it even mean? Going back to how we kicked off this presentation, what is the definition of normal work hours? And also learning that these things are actually helping you in the end produce better work because you are being more productive. And the reason for that lies in this 3M framework. Um, We'll build back and go back to this question in, in a second, but it's really important to recognize how you can take breaks throughout the day. And one of the things that's so overlooked yet so important when it comes to productivity is that we are human. We are not machines. And therefore, if we are not taking the necessary breaks before we need them, it will lead to things like burnout, like lower work quality, all things that negatively impact your, your work, your, your life, your, your like end result. Um, and, and ultimately it's kind of in everybody's best interest for you to think about how you can incorporate rest. And so the three types of breaks that are incredibly important is, and I'm going to work from the small side up to the big side, so the right to the left, is first micro breaks. And this is the type of breaks we're talking about when it's like, oh, let's go take off the garbage or let's you know, clean up the kitchen real quick. It's just a couple of minutes where you're really switching your mind to get away from your screen, to get away from the work, and to just be able to do something. Um, by shifting that context, you're really allowing yourself to put closure to what you're working on or to let yourself ruminate and continue the creative process, even though you're not taking action. And so it could be things like going to have a shower, going outside and getting a quick breath of fresh air, doing meditation or doing all of those household chores. And if you think about it in terms of oh, I'm not slacking off at work by doing things for home. I'm taking a micro break that's going to make my work better. Hopefully that reframe will help you in terms of, of releasing yourself from, from this guilt. Um, the, the second type of break that's incredibly important is to have two to four hours of break and rest. You can't work 24 hours a day. It's just not going to be realistic. Um, and so these longer breaks, and if you chunk them up through your day, because you're working in a nonlinear fashion as a, a bifastic person like me, or if you're having two to four hours of break more in the morning, and then doing work in the afternoons and evenings, like Tam, just figure out how you can incorporate these things. And it could be something that inspires you, that brings you happiness, that, that brings you back to your passion. So things like an art class, a sports game, um, I prioritize starting my week every week with a personal training, um, heavy weightlifting session and Monday morning, it is my most important task because it really sets the stage for my energy levels for the rest of the week. And it could also be things like cooking a meal since transitioning to working remotely. I cook lunch almost every day instead of focusing on what's for dinner. And I make a nutritious midday meal to really give myself that energy boost. And sometimes dinner is less important. And it's just now how I've really changed the definitions of everything in my life of like, when do I eat my, my big meals? When do I cook? When do I work? And, it, and it's all starting to blend together, which I think is really cool about trusting people and giving people the autonomy to do what feels right for them, knowing that you are getting the benefit of the end result if you're putting your corporate hat on. And then finally, macro breaks. These, these ones are the, the big ones, um, half days to full days. We think of them as weekends. Again, because I have to do everything differently for me, these are usually Wednesday walks that I take because I love to work on the weekends and go hiking when nobody else is on my trail. Um, but it can be things like hikes, visiting friends and family, day trips, um, a day sitting around on your sofa, catching up on Netflix binge shows, um, but time to truly disconnect and to really let yourself settle into rest and put the work aside. 
And while we're talking about creating these boundaries, I think one more important thing to, to tie back to those feelings of, of guilt for one last time is that while we're thinking of these things as rest and we're thinking about these things as personal enjoyment activities or taking a break from work, as you learn how to blend your work in your life and create boundaries that protect your time and your energy, you'll notice that if you're excited about your work and you're super amped about something, those thoughts will sneak in in creative ways because you'll be traveling and you'll be, you know, on a hike and see a sign and that sign will remind you of something that you could try on a creative project and everything's connected. And so normally at work, we think about productivity and work as only the actions the things we're checking off our to-do list. But I also challenge you to start thinking about what are the conversations or just the room you're creating for creative thinking, strategic thinking, and mental processing. What are the thoughts that take up your time and energy that also need your focus? Because the more you're taking breaks, the more space you're allowing for those thoughts to creep in that will positively impact your work. Thanks, Allie. Uh, I was just typing something in there, but I, I love um, the idea that work is not confined to being at your laptop, that you can get inspiration at all different times. And I think that's a huge part of creativity and just how the mind works. Um, great. So we'll share a couple of things in action. I do think we had a question come in. Somebody raised their hand. So if that's still a question, put it in chat and then Nicole can call on you. She's She's um, running running the show for us. So, but Allie, do you want to talk a little bit about some things in action for the group before we go on to the next section? Yeah. Um, so we just talked about, uh, I shared a ritual for me for, for my Monday workouts. Um, it's not necessarily a commute, but one of the things that that's sort of, I have a bone to pick with the media these days, they're, they're, they're throwing out articles around how the the commute was sacred um, because it allows you the time to create these boundaries that we just talked about. It gave you permission to have these breaks that we just talked about. And so while these breaks are important, I don't necessarily think you need to be on a subway or stuck in traffic uh, to have those breaks. And, and so instead, when it comes to remote work, I like to reframe it. And, and Tammy and I talk about this as like rituals and personal and daily weekly rituals that you can have instead that can be your transition ritual. And so I recently was visiting some friends and, and staying with them and they were working from home for the first time. And uh, a ritual that I sort of enforced on the household that I was staying with was that every morning we would get up and we would walk to our favorite local coffee shop and get a cup of coffee and have a nice like catch up morning chat about what we wanted to get done that day and get some work done. And then I would stay at the coffee shop and work because you all know my style now. And my friends would go home and work from their home office. And then that became the ritual that we had for that week that we were working together to, to kick off our day. And so it was just, you know, getting out in the neighborhood, seeing people with their dogs, saying hi to folks, um, having a nice chat with each other and that social connection, and then sitting down and recentering ourselves in our own profession worlds. And so that was a ritual that I really enjoyed. And uh, I said I would take it back to to my home, but it's been a little too cold for me to get up and do walks here in the morning, but I'm, I'm going to bring it back. Awesome. I love that, Allie. Uh, another example of that commute, we interviewed um, the COO of a WordPress agency, and I really liked how she created her own special commuting ritual. So she would finish up work and she kept a pretty standard schedule. So she didn't go completely non-linearly because her kids were in school and it just worked better with her schedule. Uh, but she would put her children to bed and then she would play piano for about an hour. And so she would practice it. And then by the time she was done playing the piano, she and her kids were asleep. She just felt like she was in a totally different space. Uh, she had had time to decompress and she had time to be in flow and there's music and it's just lovely. And then she would spend the rest of the evening just having a really nice time and being able to completely disconnect both from her different roles of being COO and roles of being a mother. 
Um, another example of taking breaks. And so again, we're, ta we're talking about things that are a little bit taboo in the workforce. And so this is something that I would have felt very, very, very guilty about at the beginning of my career. But now knowing myself better and how I work, um, I feel more comfortable doing these types of things. So one of my favorite little hacks are I get really into a certain show. And so right now, um, I guess last month it was Homeland. And so I started watching that and it went off the air a couple of years ago, but it, I was on a Claire Danes kick. And so what I would do is I would kind of promise myself that I would get a little reward of some Homeland after I finished a task. And so Allie and I had to write lots and lots of articles for the release of our book. And so I would write an article and I would draft it and I would get really excited. And then after I finished it, I'd be like, okay, Tam, you get to watch another 15 minutes of Homeland. And so I'd watch that Homeland, feel really energized by it, and then go back to another task. And so that actually worked really well for me because I was uh, writing articles faster. I wasn't dawdling. I wasn't kind of surfing around the internet or distracting myself on social media. I would open that Word document. I would get really excited about writing an article or the concept. And then I would shut off close that article down, send it to Allie to review, and I would get to, you know, kind of dive into a little bit of being in the CIA for a few moments and then go back to work. Okay, so next uh, we are going to talk a little bit about the concept of a digital house. And so I love this term when we were, we interviewed about 35 other remote experts for our book. And this actually was coined by a woman named Sarah. She works um, at the University of Edinburgh in their kind of uh, innovation and futures group. And so I guess where this came from is the fact that we know what to do in an office. So as humans, we go into a physical landscape and there are so many cues and wayfinding aspects that tell us what to do. So you go into an office and you know, if you go into a conference room, you're going to have a meeting. If there's whiteboards, you know, it's going to probably be more of a creative meeting where people are going to be drawing on the whiteboard. Um, if you go into a smaller meeting room that maybe has just, you know, two couches, that might be a great place for a one-on-one. -on -one. You go to your desk and maybe that is where you do your heads down work. You open up a spreadsheet and you start calculating numbers or you start kind of writing prose or, you know, launching code, et cetera. Uh, then you go to the coffee machine and that's where you catch up and you might have a little bit of gossip. You might talk about, you know, other things that are going on at the organization, but we knew what to do in all those different places. And then suddenly when the world collapsed and we we're all on kind of a 13 inch screen, it was very, very hard to know what happens where. And so with that, we talk a lot about organizing your digital house because it is just as important in kind of the virtual world to know where different things happen. And if you actually look at the beginnings of kind of software, you'll notice that they, um, the designers were actually using this a lot. So I don't know if you look on your desktop and you see the little trash can, that's where you empty out your like old documents. And that is actually kind of something that is in the physical world that they brought into the digital world. So people would have a cue of what to do. Um, also, even just the idea that it's called a desktop, it's, you know, that came from the idea of having a desktop where you have papers and um, folders and stuff like that. And that is actually what was on the, the digital screen as well. And so um, we recommend that you eliminate confusion and you automate decisions by having clear purpose and ways of engaging with all your tools. And so this can remove dependencies, increase uh, transparency, and also it helps to have some simple rules around this. And so to talk a little bit about what a digital house might look like and what simple rules might be is when you have a team, you're going to want to say like what happens in what place. And so, for example, like um, uh, what often happens, I think, with this is I don't know if you've been there, but I have definitely been there at, at other organizations where there can be like five different channels to communicate a message. And so you may have email, you may have Slack, you may have some type of like an internal network. You may also have a Google Doc and you can be on Zooms. There's all these different ways to communicate different messages. And so you can notice that you might be communicating in the wrong channel or crossing channels or messages might not be getting out. And so we find it really important to set up your digital house where you know what type of activities happen where. So for example, all project management may happen in Asana or all communication that is long form should happen. For example, when I was at 
WordPress, it would be on a WordPress blog that was open up to the entire company. So everybody could see kind of long form if there's anything really important to be documented there. And then all casual chats happened in Slack. And so those were different rules around it. Uh, Ali, do you want to talk a little bit more about kind of your digital house and how you do simple rules and some of your examples from DuckDuckGo? Yeah. And what I love about this, especially if you are influencing the digital house on a team, is it might seem really heavy in the IT world or tools and technology, but it really does have such a huge impact on personal productivity for all of the reasons that, that you shared, Tam, when you introduced a digital house. When people can remove all of this mental labor and guesswork and feeling overwhelmed because they're getting the same message in multiple places, they can just focus on managing their time, their energy, and their focus. Um, and, and so really, I think when it comes to setting this up for the first time, it's important to know how everybody likes to work and then find similar themes and shared expectations to set it up. And so what this looked like when I was leading a team of five internationally distributed people was that it was pretty impossible on the same day in the same time zone to do the kickoff that me and Tam do now of this is our top priority for the day, um, for the week rather, and have everyone have that information be on there at like a certain time. So instead, we still used a template. It was still in Asana. Um, we still talked about what our top priority was, but the ritual we had was that over a 24 hour time period, it would get kicked off and people would also share when their general availability was and a reminder of what time zone they were in. And so that helped us with last minute requests on our casual, um, internal communication tool and for scheduling meetings. So we didn't have to always remember that about people each time. We could just open up the, the document for the week and have it next to our calendars when we were trying to figure things out. So that was a ritual that we included in the work week using things like templates and a process that it lasted for 24 hours every Monday. And so hitting on all of those questions, we were able to set up that system. Another thing that worked really well, because um, people, I think... You know, we talk a lot about productivity and project management, but part of part of productivity is, is learning what makes you feel motivated at work. And a lot of people feel motivated by having human connections. And that doesn't need to happen always on synchronous calls or Zoom team building things. There's ways to build a sense of belonging with your team using the digital house. And so something that we incorporated at DuckDuckGo that was before my time and then, you know, it grew and grew while I was there um, as the director of people was an asynchronous ask me anything thread. And so every Thursday, the CEO would post a question. And sometimes the question was professional. Um, what skill set do you feel like you could use a training on right now? Sometimes it was personal, like what did you eat for dinner last night? And um, sometimes it was more cultural, like what's a great book, fiction or nonfiction that you would recommend? And between Thursday when it was posted and Friday at our company All Hands, people asynchronously would share pictures, ideas, links, and it was a great way to get to know people and feel connected with them without having to give up additional time. And it was a great thing to use one of those mezzo breaks on when you wanted a break from work and you were like, oh, I want to go like read up on like what books people are recommending or I just finished the book. Um, Tam and I both recently read a book called Tomorrow, uh, Tomorrow, Tomorrow, Tomorrow. What is it? Um, and like, we didn't realize that we both read it for like around the same time period. And if we had this cultural system, um, we could have chimed in and been like, oh yeah, I read that too and felt connected to each other. And, and so it really can help bring up those energy boosts in a way that is still asynchronous and is still allowing people to own their schedule and their time. Great, Allie. I think those are really awesome examples. I'm going to talk about two other ones just to add to this conversation. So um, a couple of days ago, I had a catch up with an old friend. We used to work together uh, maybe 12 years ago at the beginning of our careers uh, when we were both at Google. And so he has started a company called Nash. They do really cool things with micropayments and Bitcoin and all this different stuff that he was telling me about very excitedly. Um, but we were talking about remote work because he is the founder of an all remote 
company. And he was like, originally we were having a hard time brainstorming. And I know I hear this a lot within kind of news articles. People are like, remote work isn't great for creative work. Uh, we can't do the brainstorming. What happens when we don't have that whiteboard anymore? Um, but I, what I loved is like the way that Jared approached this was through a process. And so every time they're thinking about a new feature to add into their product or a new way to do UX design, they actually go through a very specific ritual together asynchronously. So the first thing he'll do is say, hey, okay, this is kind of the brief, this is the problem statement of what we're looking at for a feature. What I want is for everybody to take a couple days, go off in your own directions and find some type of inspiration. And so this could be inspiration in the physical world. So maybe you wanna get inspiration on a color palette. Maybe people take pictures of different things that they see in nature. This could be, oh, look at these beautiful flowers or these colors that was on this hike, or you may be traveling around or go into a grocery store and see some like very cool labels that you're like, oh, I love the graphic design on this. Um, I don't know, snack can or uh, this packaging for oat milk. Um, and so they would all come back and they would say, here's all this inspiration I found. Some people would find it on the internet. They may look at competitors' products. Um, but then they all do kind of a share and tell back of like, this is what really inspired me. And so by doing this, you allow everybody time to like go into their own world. You get to actually be in your real space. It's not all digital and people are not going to be as influenced by each other. So they're going to come in with actually new content because often when you're brainstorming in a group, uh, there's this thing called hippo that often happens, which is the highest paid person's opinion. And so you end up having a lot of group think and a lot of group think around uh, the highest paid individual or the most senior person in the room. And this process really allowed people to be creative and share and get really new ideas and cross pollinate that across the organization. So that was something I really loved as an example. Um, is there anything else that we want to talk about, Allie, before we open it up for questions? I think um, we can just recap all of the ideas. We shared a lot of information. So going back to the fact that you can only capture 10 minutes at a time, let's do a quick recap and see what questions come up once people's memories are, are triggered. So awesome. we learned a lot about productivity. Tam, do you wanna take us through everything we talked about in the past uh, almost hour today? Okay, and what's nice is with this recap, everybody from this webinar is going to get a free copy of our book and we go into a lot more detail. It's a really casually written, it's so interactive. There's quizzes and Mad Libs and reflection questions. So you can go into this in detail and see lots of fun case studies from people that we interviewed. Um, but as we mentioned for getting things done and being productive, it is defined as the ability to generate, create, and produce outputs. And so we are really thinking about output culture more than input culture. Input culture is like, did I do my tasks in my task list? Did I work for eight hours today? Did I, um, did I do things that I think are fast? And when you move instead into more of an output culture, you start thinking about what did I create? What is the value that I'm delivering? And so that is really important when you're thinking about productivity as a whole. Um, we had three pillars. So the first thing was managing your energy and we shared the energy tracker with you. We also shared um, a, a PDF that we created on how to find your biological chronotypes, but that can start helping you plan your most important work to work when you are actually energized to do it. And so rather than you know saying, hey, I'm gonna wake up at 7 a.m. even though I know for a fact that I'm a night owl uh, to do work because somebody told me that's the best time to do work, you can start actually creating your schedule non-linearly to be around when you do work best and actually do things a lot faster. There was this great McKinsey study that it showed that executives do things five times faster or more effectively during their peak hours than at other hours, but they only spend 5% of that time doing important tasks. And what this actually means is that you could have the same task and it could take you one hour if you do it during your like most productive time and you really get into it versus if you do it at another time when you're not energized and you're in a lag, it can take you five hours. And that is a huge difference when it comes to productivity. The next thing was managing your time. And so we talked about the concept of MITs and non-MITs, how to make sure that you get one or two really important tasks done. And then you can fill in smaller tasks across the way. It's also important to triage stuff that comes in because as we know, there's often fire drills at work. And so rather than letting that distract you and get you off path, it's great to triage that, put it into kind of a, a to-do or like, let's think about this later list. And then you can start putting those back into your MITs and non-MITs when you have time to reprioritize. 
And the last thing is focus. And so Ali talked a lot about uh, the 3M concept of taking breaks. And I know sometimes this can make you feel guilty. It can be a little counterintuitive to how we grew up with kind of the school system and the work system, et cetera. But as we know from the poll, you can only focus for seven to 10 minutes at a time for the most part. Obviously, you can get into hyper focus. You might focus even less if it's something you don't want to do. So it really depends. But on average, seven to 10 minutes, your mind also wanders 30 percent of the time. So instead of like working against this, work with it and make sure you take those breaks and take real breaks, because what I notice is if I don't take a break my brain will want to do it anyways. And so that means I'm surfing on the internet or I'm kind of like distracted or I'm not really doing something, but I'm pretending I'm doing something and I'm just really slow and not very effective. So instead, it's so much more important to take a real break, whether that's five minutes to stretch and take a coffee, that might be once a week doing something for two hours where you're completely checked out and you're painting or you're going for a walk or a hike. And that could also mean that once a month that you are going completely online and taking a day off where you just are are not on your phone, you are not on your computer, you are not talking about work so that you can truly recharge and be your best self. And the second concept we talked about was organizing your digital house. It is sometimes very hard to know what happens where when everything is on a flat screen, especially when we're used to a world where there's so many cues of what to do where. And so it's really important to start having simple rules to know what type of activities happen where so that everybody is organized around the same principles. This is also really important if you have people that are going on vacation or people go on maternity or uh, paternity leave or they leave the organization. By having this digital house, you can ensure that all the materials that they had are in a place even if they're not physically present at your organization at that moment. And so that's a little bit of the recap of the things that we talked about today. But as mentioned, it is all in our book and everybody can get a free copy today if you fill out the form uh, that Nicole just put into the chat. Allie, anything else you want to add? No, this was really great. Um, thanks so much, everybody. And feel free to get in touch with us on LinkedIn and follow us on our website, remoteworksbook.com.